Hello everyone, welcome to this research methods tutorial about ethics. You should know all of this by now, so I'm not going to read them all individually, but if you're not familiar with the format of these videos, then you can pause the video here and have a quick read. So, codes of ethics and ethical guidelines are rules which psychologists must follow when they're conducting research. And we need them to protect the research participants and to uphold the reputation of psychology. In the UK, the British Psychological Society, or BPS, is the organisation which publishes those ethical guidelines. So here are all of the ethical guidelines that you need to be familiar with, and I need to give thanks to Mr Gill for allowing me to borrow his DC Cowpad mnemonic to help you remember these. So that's Detective Constable Cowpad. You could draw the picture into your notes if that will help you to revise and help you to remember the ethics guidelines. But otherwise, let's just have a look at each one of those in turn. Okay, the first ethical issue that you need to be aware of is deception. It is sometimes necessary for researchers to mislead participants in their research, but as far as possible, deliberate deception should be avoided. An example of where deception was necessary was Milgram's study. So if you think what would have happened if Milgram had told his participants that he was studying obedience and that actually the learner wasn't receiving any electric shocks, the research wouldn't have been worth carrying out. Ways of dealing with deception include telling participants immediately after the study and giving them the opportunity to withdraw their data. Researchers should try to gain consent from the participants who are taking part in their studies and they should provide them with enough information about the study to ideally give informed consent. Information for informed consent can include details on the procedures of the study, if that's possible, the time it might take to complete the study, the types of data that are going to be collected and what's going to happen with that data, how the data will be kept confidential and so on. It's important to note that for children under the age of 16, parental consent must be obtained, as well as consent from the child if they're old enough to understand what's going on in the study. To deal with the issue of consent, the researcher could provide a consent form which has all of the information about the study before the study actually takes place for the participants to read and then sign to show that they agree with what's going to happen. Another ethical issue is confidentiality. Researchers have a legal responsibility to ensure that all data relating to a participant remains confidential. They might need to make it clear to the participants before the study begins that there may be times when confidentiality needs to be breached. So for example, if a researcher is studying something like depression and a participant says that they are thinking of harming themselves, the researcher has a duty of care to, to report this to their research supervisor and to seek advice. Ways of dealing with confidentiality include not identifying the participants by name and not including any details about them which could identify them to somebody else who was reading the report. There are specific guidelines which apply to the use of observational research. So when conducting observational research, the observers should respect people's privacy and they shouldn't observe people where they would not normally expect to be observed. So for example, in toilets or in changing rooms. To deal with the issue of observational research, researchers should only observe people in public areas and, if at all possible, use overt observation rather than covert. Withdrawal is another ethical issue that psychologists need to consider. Participants should be made aware that they have the right to withdraw from the study at any time, even if they have been paid to take part in the study. This should be made clear when participants give their consent to take part. A way of dealing with the issue with withdrawal is to explain to participants before the study even begins that they can stop the study at any point if they feel uncomfortable. This includes after the study has been completed, so they may withdraw their data afterwards if they don't want it to be included in the research. It's very important that participants should not be subjected to any kind of physical or mental harm during the study, as far as possible.
participants should leave the study in the same state of body and mind as when they arrived. When a psychologist is planning their research, their proposals will be examined by an ethics committee who may suggest changes to the research to remove any potential for harm. Even if the research has been passed by the ethics committee, the researcher should stop the study immediately if a participant becomes distressed. They could also refer participants to a counsellor or to another appropriate professional for support if necessary. Guidelines relating to advice are particularly relevant for researchers who are studying sensitive topics. Sometimes a researcher might discover in the course of their study that a participant has a psychological condition that they are not aware of, such as depression or low self-esteem. Here the researcher has a responsibility to alert the participant, but they should not offer any advice if they're not qualified to do so. They could cause the participant more harm if they do try to. If this situation does occur, the researcher should try to refer the participant to an appropriately qualified person who might be able to offer them further advice if necessary. They should also seek advice from their research supervisor just to help make that decision. And the final ethical guideline concerns the use of debriefing. So participants should be given a debrief after they've completed the study and this should give them any information which had to be withheld from them at the beginning and ensure that they've not been adversely affected by their participation. However, debriefing cannot be used to justify the use of harmful, harmful procedures in the study. A way of dealing with debriefing is to reveal the true aims of the study to the participant and allow them to ask any questions to fill in any gaps in their understanding. And that's all folks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon. Bye.